Soldiers marching as to war With the cross of Jesus Going on before Christ the royal master Leads against the foe Forward into battle See his banners go Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur or complain beneath a chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempest rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and then whatever may come, we'll taste in here the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save, and fit it for the sky, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live. And o'er oh, thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. Assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Rise up, O man of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O man of God, this kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O man of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to her task, rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod. As brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O man of God.
Good morning. I see somebody has changed the background on us again. That is, oh, the tiger swallowtail butterfly. Or no, not the tiger swallowtail, just the regular swallowtail. Sam, I don't think O'Shea is here, or uh, Sean, O'Shea is not here to appreciate your uh, paragraphs. Didn't you post that up in the put in the page there uh, yesterday? Keep working at it, Sean. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Teresa. How are we all doing today? Good morning, Pat. I'll uh, say hello, Dad. Hello, Dad. <laughs> the beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's supposed to get up into the mid 90s today. Sun is shining. The birds, all oh, the birds are singing. You hear them birds out there? Listen to them praising their maker. thankful to God for any progress that is made on uh, overcoming sin. Amen. Rejoice with them that rejoice. And weep with them that weep. We read that last week in our uh, um Roman, uh, 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 thing on Romans 12. Alicia, I think, is the one that's in the background. Yes. Uh, Alicia, do you have the Bible up? Because it's suddenly dropped off. Hmm. <laughs> What are we reading? Yesterday, uh, well, what was it? Uh, about midweek last week, uh, O'Shea and Amos on their daily uh, runs, uh, you know, with for work, ran into um, or bumped into my next younger brother's supervisor. My next younger brother lives about six miles from me as the crow flies. And he works in the town seven miles from us. Anyway, they uh, were at the grocery store or something and ran into the, you know, met this 
gentleman, the supervisor. And um, his supervisor said to pass a message to me that he had some uh, uh, cinder blocks. And uh, that that he uh, he wondered if I was interested in, and if I didn't come and get them or wasn't didn't want them, why they were going to go into some farmer's ditch, um, because the city was after him to clean up his yard. And uh, I'm like, well, yeah, we could use them for some building stuff. So I was going to go get them Saturday after we got done mowing. Uh, yeah, I didn't hear you, Alyssa, because my audio was turned way down. Still on night mode. Um, O'Shea is on the phone, tagging and all that stuff. Alyssa is running background. <clears throat> Alyssa, we're reading Romans 13 today. Um... Yeah, that side note, O'Shea gets the day off from uh, his regular job today, but he's got plenty to do here at home, so he ain't going to be slacking. Going to make good use of the day off. Um, what was I at? So we uh, were going to do that yesterday, or Saturday after we got done mowing, but it was about seven o'clock by the time we got home seven fifteen. so it's like okay we can't you know we're not gonna we're not gonna do that good morning sue ross how you doing good morning heather good to see you uh, and uh so we May decided to do it yesterday after we got home from worship. So we went in yesterday, we took our trailer. We didn't load it full because it's not meant to carry that much weight. So we pulled two loads of cinder blocks from his place. And uh, we also got, I love it when God blesses you the, the way he has us. Um, we got a mudroom wash tub or a laundry room wash tub, however you want to say that. Amen, Sister Sue. And we got uh, some, you know, Shea got a nice load of flower pots. We got two squirrel cage fans that we can place to move air in our greenhouse when we get it built. We have also received the gift of a bunch of engine parts off of one of his uh uh, mowers that he was sending to the dump that had a blown engine on it that was similar to one of ours. So we just, yeah, and, and he gave it all to us for free. Morning, Laura. We'll definitely keep praying for you, Sean. You know you're always in our prayers, just as much as you're always in our heart, brother. The one thing, you know, I hope that I'm teaching my kids, and I know that uh, <clears throat> the oldest two have found out in riding along with the... Uh, um, 
one of their bosses is always keep your eyes open for the Lord's blessings. Because um, you never know where or when he's going to give you something. I know that when uh, I was working with um, Brother Larry Glade, we'd be driving along and he's uh, talking a mile a minute and we're carrying on having a grand old time and pretty and he'd spot something alongside the road and slow down, you know, just to pull off real quick, fast in a hurry, jump out of the truck, walk back, you know, and pick up whatever it was he spotted. Sometimes it was some tools. Sometimes it was something else. You never know. Um, and that helped bring home a lesson that I had learned many, many years ago reading a, a book. But you just never know when God's going to bless you. And I took that lesson to heart. All right, Sister T. You just you just never know. We've found um, we found patio furniture by the road that was just perfectly fine that somebody didn't have strapped down on their uh, load. We've found um, tools. We've found. Uh, Lumber, we've found pallets, we've found um, tanks, as in a, uh, a, a sprayer tank that we are going to turn around and, and uh, use for a closed water system. Um, not that we'll ever use it for watering plants, and it's going to be a closed water system to, to work for heat. Um, and it's just... Uh, we found hay bales. You just never know what's going to come your way. Sue says, uh, you're so good you're teaching your children these valuable lessons. My mother taught me a lot. But in 45, uh, 54 years of marriage, my husband taught me even more. It has really helped me since I'm now alone. You always keep your eyes peeled. Is God, yeah, <laughs> that's right, Ezra. Or, I mean, Oshea. Oh man, we found a socket set, we had it, and it had the exact socket we needed. It just it came in so, I mean, it's just like. This was a perfect gift from God. We needed it at the exact time, the exact perfect time. Then one day we were headed out and the grader had been by and, hey, look, there's something there. What is that? I sent the boys back to get it. It turned out to be a PTO shaft. Well, I hold it for a little while and then I asked Dad, I said, Dad, do you need a PTO shaft? He's like, huh? Well, here. And we gave it to him, and he turned around, and he put it on Facebook, saying, hey, did anybody in, in this neighborhood lose this? And the neighbor two houses down says, I think, you know, I think that's mine. And turned out it was like a... A very expensive, and I'm thinking anywhere between seven hundred to over a thousand dollar piece of equipment that he was uh, frantically looking for, trying to figure out where he dropped it. Mm. Sue says, I know how to use things in different ways. That's right. You you just never know. God is full of surprise blessings. 
keep your eyes out for it. He watches out for his children. He really does. Yeah, we needed that that exact socket to fix the car. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Heather says, my grandparents lived through the Depression. They taught me how to be frugal and resourceful. And you always end up trying to uh, find ways to repurpose things. And like, like uh, Sue said, you just, you know, you may have something and it may have one in use, but you changed it around and you, you turn it around and find it a different, more creative use for it that is more needful in that particular instance. So you just, you really don't ever really know. But if you keep your eyes open, God will bless you in ways you just don't understand. Yes, resourceful. That is the word. My grandparents also lived through the Great Depression. And my great-grandparents did. My great-grandparents uh, and, of course, my mother's parents, my father's parents, they, they lived through it. Ooh. And uh, um, um, <laughs> what are you going to be working on? Well, I'm going to finish my cup of coffee and then probably head out fiddle around the garden for a bit and head over to the hole. I was thinking since you're here to maybe start working some of this up. Or have you weed over by the uh, asparagus? Oh, yeah, I need to get that mm -hmm. weeded. Yeah, I think you need to get that. I, you, have, um, I need straw to lay down the water area. Well, there's a whole bunch of straw you could rake up in the backyard. I'm thinking it's all nicely finely blended now that I ran over it. <laughs> it just blew them up in the pile and finally blended. Of course, by the time you get done weeding, you're going to have plenty of weeds to lay down, too. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Come think of it. Yeah, I can blame it. Well, Sam, it, yes, you need, we need to be wise with our money and time and things and always be a giver. <clears throat> God created us to be stewards of his creation. And uh, what I was starting to say was that my grandparents and my great-grandparents taught my parents how to be frugal and resourceful specifically on my mother's side they really taught my mother a lot um my mother grew up in a essentially what was a single family home um or single family home single parent home um uh, I don't recall grandma ever th that grandma ever married again after um, uh, my mom's dad. And that was like her second or third marriage anyway. But uh, she raised mom and my aunt. And in the summers, mom would, uh, mom and aunt Jackie would, spend a lot of time with um, my great-grandparents and with their cousins. And uh, mom learned a lot about being frugal and being resourceful. And then it prepared her for well for the life of being a preacher's wife 
and raising seven children. Welcome back, Sister T. Um, indeed, Sue. Sassafras tea, uh, licorice tea, whorehound tea. Um, you didn't just drop everything and run to the doctor. We did a lot of home doctoring. That's where a lot of my knowledge comes from. Um, if you had a wound, you did it yourself. Uh, we use comfrey. We use plantain. We use Epsom salts. Soak the wound. Um, then you bandage it and you allow it to heal. What do you need to go to the doctor for? Yes, ma'am. Seven children, six boys and one girl. Um, we had one acre garden initially for our home garden. We had at one point a 10 acre truck garden or produce farm. Um, we had chickens, we had cow milk cow or two. Sometimes, I, I can even remember when we had a couple of milk goats because I'm lactose intolerant. Have been since I was born. And um, so they're there for a long time. They either bought goat's milk from a local uh, uh, producer or they raised their own goats. And then that got too much, and so they switched to cow's milk, and I had to deal with it. Um, I don't know about Boyle. Sam, you can ask uh, my mother if you see her or send her a private message. Look for Deborah E. Fram. That is her, that is her pseudonym. Her, um, she, when she first was starting out learning to uh, gonna write, that was going to be her pen name, and then she just decided to use her real name. <clears throat> but she joins us occasionally on the reading as Deborah E. Fram. Um, her real name is Donna B. Westfall. Sue said, oh, bless her. <laughs> Teresa said, my niece had 10 children. I can't handle them all. Sue says, my son has four sons, and that's a lot to feed. Can't imagine having six boys. And yet they fed us and kept us clothed and put up with all of our shenanigans. <laughs> Warts, milkweed. Uh, you take the milk of a milkweed and you put it on the wart and apply multiple times a day, multiple days. Yeah, C days at camp, so Sister T has to step in, I guess. We didn't, um, you know, I mean, we... We were rough on our pants and everything like that, shirts and stuff. Mom sewed our shirts and, uh, as in made our shirts most of the time. And mom and grandma, my dad's mother. Uh, my mom's mother was not much of a part of our life. She had moved down to Florida before I can recall. Um, I don't even recall ever meeting her. And... Um, she passed away early in the 80s. So it would have been early in my life anyway. And uh, <clears throat> interesting side note on that uh, was that we don't have it confirmed 
But there was a note from a lady in the nursing home down where my grandma lived after she developed cancer or whatever it was um, that sent a note to us and said something, sent a note to mom and said something to the effect that grandma had actually put on Christ in baptism before she passed away. So there is a small grain of hope and comfort to mother in that. My grandmother was a very interesting woman. Uh, she led a very interesting life. Um, she was an alcoholic for most of it, quite a lot of it. And she was not known to, to have any pure language. Quite the salty woman. But there towards the end, there was the report that she had put on Christ in baptism. So. <laughs> Anyhow, mom... Uh, Mom so made our shirts, and uh, of course, we always we bought. This was back when DG actually had um, a good clothing part of the store. They actually used to carry blue jeans, and I can remember we could go in and get uh, blue jeans that fit us for five dollars a pair. So we'll leave that in the Lord's hands in regard to grandma and her salvation. But um, yeah, mom and dad kept us fed, kept us clothed. And um, I've tried to pass on, uh, they passed on some wealth of knowledge to us kids. And I'm trying to pass on what little I can remember to my kids. And I know that mom and dad are each taken a different hand in uh, helping. Uh, dad and Amos were conversing the other night, Saturday night in the, on the sun porch uh, about um, mechanics and mom and O'Shea converse about gardening and art so, you know, mom and Amy and Alicia will talk about cooking and stuff like that. So, you know, their grandparents play an active part, an active role in my kids' lives as well. Not to the same extent, I think, as what um, their grandparents played in their part of lives, but... Uh, at least there is some sharing of knowledge going on. <laughs> Sue says, you see, uh, I'm as old or older than your mother. Teresa says, it'll be uh, 12 before you know it, Sister Sue. That's right. It will be. It's 9.42. Oh, wow. We've already been uh, talking 33 minutes. Yep. We better get breeding. Sam knows, says, the Lord knows the heart. That's true. All right, we're on lesson 119 of the I Grow Daily Devotional. Written by Philip Johnson, produced by written by Philip Johnson, produced by Focus Press. We are uh, going to put one minute on the clock. And timer. All right. And uh, Alicia, did you put the uh, link and stuff in? There's one going and scrolling across the bottom of the screen, and pretty soon there'll be a link in the chat. There is a link in the description where you can go to purchase this book should you want to. I always have to put that disclaimer in that we do not own any portion of this uh Material, we are using it as a guide only. 
And uh, here we go. Buckle up, Buttercup. Let's get on this bouncy ride. One minute on the clock as we read and meditate on the words of Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. If Alicia will bring that up for me. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Before I put the minute on the clock. Matthew 26, or 22, 36 through 40. Yo, ho, ho, and a cup of coffee. Yo, Alicia. Finding it? Matthew. Chapter 22. All right, now, verses 36 through 44. Or 40, rather. 36 through 40. Here we go. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Which is the great commandment in the law? And he said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like unto it, is this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, the whole law hangeth, and the prophets. One minute. The Lord thy God is one. Now shall I the Lord I God of all the All right. Now we're going to put four minutes on the clock as we read Romans 13. Uh, Alicia, Romans 13. Excellent. Thank you. Let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Therefore he that resisteth the power withstandeth the ordinance of God, and they that withstand shall receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. And wouldest thou have no fear of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise from the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. Uh, back up one line, Alicia. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in... Now you can go down. In vain, for he is a minister of God, an avenger of wrath, for wrath to him that doeth evil. Scroll down one click. And, there you go. Wherefore ye must needs be in subjection, not only because of the wrath, scroll, but also for conscience sake. For this cause ye pay tribute also, for they are ministers of God, service attending continually upon this very thing 
Render to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Scroll. Owe no man anything save to love one another, for he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is summed up in this word. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And this knowing the season, that already it is time for you to awake out of sleep. For now is salvation nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far spent, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk becomingly, as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Yes, Sue, uh, that's exactly right. We did um, talk about that last night. And I remember it, um, I remember it striking uh, in my head that that was that point also. Ah, so that's where that is. <laughs> as, well, as I was reading, it's like, oh, so that's where that is. All right, we're going to put four minutes again on the clock as we reflect on our answer to these four questions. Question one, what is one important question you learned from this chapter? What is one important lesson you learned from this chapter? Question number two, what is the importance of love in our relationship with God and our neighbors? What is the importance of love in our relationship with God and our neighbors? Question number three, how do we learn to love someone? How do we learn to love someone?
And finally, question four, how strong is your love for God? Let's see a question four, please. Thank you. How strong is your love for God? knew you were awake sister t i was about ready to tell you to wake up but i thought ah no she's waiting until we get done before she starts answering because she's writing down the questions (laughs) all right question one was what is one important lesson you learned from this chapter Alicia. Question one. What is one important lesson you learned from this chapter? All right. Sue says it's the number one importance. Wait a minute. No, I think you missed one, Alicia. Go back. Go up further. That's why you got to go to the uh, starred tab. Doing what is right just because it is right and not to avoid punishment. Heather says we must obey the laws of the land unless they go against the scriptures. Sam says respect for all, uh, respect all authority and live at peace with all men. Cast off darkness. And then Sister T at the very bottom says verse 9. There it is. (laughs) Okay, so verse 9, Alicia is bringing up for me. I am going to get that. Fly. Likes to live dangerously. For this, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. Whoops. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is summed up in this word. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I like all of these answers. And what Sue does is she brings about basically the heart of the matter as does the Apostle Paul. There are people that believe Okay, let me ask you. Have you ever heard the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans? Or perhaps you're more familiar with the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas.
there are people out there, sad to say, Christians that believe and have exercised this, that when they are in the different foreign nations, that they abide by the customs and rules of the foreign nations. Yeah, Sean said he has to go to town, Sister T, so I think he's getting ready for that. It's what they call situational ethics. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to be different, and we are at all times to abide by his standards. His standards do not change. Whether we are living in the inner city of America, the countryside of America, or we are living in the polygamist uh village of the pygmies where they run around naked sue has to run to the courthouse take care of some business thank you sue i, I love your responses you have a safe trip and we'll we'll be praying for that and hopefully you'll get to come back and Rejoin us. God has called us to do the right thing. And, and ethics is this. Christian ethics is this. Doing the right thing for the right reasons, even though nobody's watching. Because God is watching at all times. Heather says, I heard a well-known brother teach that situational ethics was okay. I was floored. It's never okay to lie, no matter the circumstances. Amen. It's never okay to lie. Ever. There is no such thing in the scriptures as a little white lie. I was talking with a brother the other day. And he made the comment that he was trying to live according to the scriptures. And I told him, I said, you know, that just like Yoda, there is no try in the scriptures. It is either do or do not. The minute we start saying, I'm trying to live up to the scriptures, we open the door for failure. That is not to say that we won't fail. But brethren, we've got to overcome this mindset wherein we allow ourselves to fail. We allow ourselves that leeway. Yes, we are all human, but that should never be used as an excuse. Jesus doesn't say, try to live faithful unto death. Now, does he? If you go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, does it say unto that church, try and live faithful unto death? If we look here at what the scripture that Sister T posted up, verse 9 here, do you see anywhere that it says, try not to do, you know, try, try to love your neighbor as yourself? O'Shea says, lies are all black holes, like Rigoletto said. Right. If you've never watched the movie Rigoletto by uh, Feature Films for Families, um, I encourage you to see if your library has it. If or if you can find it, I believe there are, uh, you know, YouTube might actually have it. I know they have the songs. Um, I think they might actually have the movie. 
Samsa, and and I I encourage you to, to watch it. It's a really good, decent family movie. There's no cussing in there. There's no inappropriate scenes in there, um, and there's no violence. Well, there is a little bit of violence, but you don't see it. That's a really way a straight weird way to say that. Um, there there's there's a man that gets beaten. But um, you actually don't see the blows being hit. Let's put it that way. There's the the idea is it is implied. Uh, Sam says one th- Psalm one thirty six one through six. There's no place that a person can hide from God. <coughs> Told you I'd get that fly. <coughs> yeah, put him back out. Rigoletto. O'Shea, um, O'Shea, would you actually go get the video and uh, bring it out here? I'll show it on. I'll actually show the title on screen. Or have your sister do it. But but listen, there is no try. Jesus says, live faithful unto death. Paul says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God said back in Exodus when he gave the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other God before me. Don't try not to have another God before me. He didn't. He said, you shall not murder. He didn't say, don't try not to murder. God said, do. There is no try. Christians are to live in obedience to the law of God. And God commands us to be obedient to our governments. God says you are to live obedient to my law. And he says you are to do the right thing for the right reasons all the time. Can you, can you see it there, Sister T? And those of us like Alicia's brought the voice is not showing live yet. Alicia, bring me up full screen. On my video pause. Still hearing the audio, but the video pause. There we are. Yeah, you can see it. R I G O L E T T O. Rigoletto. Okay. It's a musical. It has some good truths in it. It has some very good truths in it. And you will you will enjoy it, I'm fairly oh certain. There's some good laughter in it. Um there's some tears. And there's a very some very wonderful singing in it. So a Christian is supposed to obey the government. And you're right, Heather. Breaking the speed limit is a sin. It literally is. The government has, in their wisdom, said that we are not to go above... 55 on the highway. And so if we go 56, if we set our cruise at 56, at 70, we're breaking the law intentionally. I'm not saying that there won't be times that we unintentionally break the law. But we really do, you know, break the law when we speed. Now, if we do that, 
Are we not breaking the law of God, which tells us to obey? Bring me up 13, verse 1 again, Alicia. Let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. That doesn't mean that evil governments are operating or doing evil under the auspice of God. In other words, God doesn't say, God, God is not condoning evil in any way, shape, or form. That's saying that God has ordained man, the government, to be an authority. It is saying, though, that those who wield authority are to be obeyed. And the principle is that so long as they do not negate the law of God, so long as they do not cross the law of God, you and I are to be in obedience to them. And that principle comes actually from Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 4, or is it 3? Where Peter says, we choose you, you, know, you judge whether it's more right to obey God or you. And that's the first one. And that's in Acts chapter 3, I believe. No, that's in Acts chapter. Yeah. Anyway, and then in Acts chapter 4, or I mean, Acts chapter 5, it says, we must obey God rather than man. So, as long as it does not negate God's law, as long as it doesn't cross God's law, God's law says you obey it. But if it prohibits us from assembling and worshiping our God, we will break that law because our God has commanded us to assemble, even if it means we go into the wilderness and we assemble and worship God, we will assemble and worship God in the wilderness. Even if it says, I will, you know, you are not to make mention of God, I will make mention of God. Many times, a lot of us are guilty of utilizing the discretionary practice of police. Because, you see, a judge will throw out a, law, throw out a speeding ticket that is for, four, for five or under miles over the speed limit. And police have great discrepancy or discretionary powers. But we must make every effort we can to ensure that we ourselves, while we're in control of that vehicle, are doing what the law says. Situational ethics is never right. God has called us to a higher standard. That is, that we do what is right at all times, whether anyone is watching or not. Brother Jim Waldron uh, had a very good book on ethics, and I believe it's a uh, cream-colored book up on top of the shelf, Alicia. Could you see if there's one up there? Looks kind of like the sighting in color out here. Can you bring that to me? 
Green. Don't worry about it. Okay, at least you'll try to get it. Green what? Cream. It's the cream colored. Kind of looks like the siding that we have on the house out here. And if you remember the link that I had posted. Yes, I believe so. Do you know the shelf right above you in the office? Mm -hmm. It's up there. It's called situation. It's called uh, what'd you say it was, Ezra? Or Shea? It's like cream and red. And switch us to question number two as we go uh, while you're in there, sweetie, while you're looking for it. Question number two is, what is the importance of love in our relationship with God and our neighbors? And I got you. I got the uh, answers while you're doing that list. Just don't worry about it. Just find that book for me. Universal ethics. It's cream and or white in other words and hot uh, pink he says sue says that it's the number one importance diana says it's of or excuse me heather says it's of the utmost importance if we do not love god we will not show love to our neighbors as we should sam says it's keeping on christ to love with our whole heart heather follows up with a oh that's number three Hey, thank you. Um, okay, well, this one's a Greek lexicon. Not going to work. This one's a green, so that's not going to work. That's a divorce uh, a debate by Olin Hicks and versus Jim Waldron. Uh, this is another good one. Biblical ethics and modern science. And the other one's hymn stories. Uh, hymns and stories, so that's not it. So it's going to be... It's going to be about the size of that one that your thumb's on, the second book in. And it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be cream and it's going to be cream colored. So it'll be like this color right here. So this is one, this is by Wayne Jackson. It's also a good one, Bible ethics, biblical ethics and modern science. Um, and Wayne Jackson covers some uh, questions like, does a woman have the right to control her own body? Does abortion end the life of a human being? Is suicide an acceptable way to terminate one's life? Have human beings been cloned? Um, and I'm just reading the back here. Uh, can one ethically practice artificial insemination by a donor in order to produce a child? Will scientists someday control human behavior? These and dozens of similar ch questions challenge the attention of every thinking person. Nope. Um, in the modern world, Wayne Jackson has examined these issues in the light of biblical revelation, the only source of true ethical instruction. So anyway, okay. And sister T says two verse nine again, because we are, supposed to love God with our heart and soul and mind and God tells us to love our neighbor so what is the importance of love in our relationship with our neighbors or uh, in our relationship with God and our neighbors it is of the utmost importance it is the hinge pin not just of the law and the prophets but it's also the hinge pin of Christ's law Nope, that's apologetics, and that's definitely not it because that's green. Well, I'll keep looking. Maybe it's on the. Maybe now it's on the. On the bookshelf, maybe, but I don't think so. It is the hinge pin of our law of God's law in regard to the new covenant. 
Jesus said, as we read in Matthew 22, that that it that the greatest commandment in Moses' law was, well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second was like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, that was brought over into the new, to, new covenant. It was restated. If God is not first in our life, how are we going to love our neighbor? Jesus was asked, who then is my neighbor? And he had the a parable of the Good Samaritan. Who was the neighbor? What was the what was the point of the parable of the Samaritan? You had a Levite who was not supposed to defile himself because he was a priest. And this appeared to be a dead body. Was he right in not rendering aid? Jesus said, no, he wasn't. But he passed by on the one side. You had a Jew pass by and uh, didn't want to render aid. But you had a stranger come by, the Samaritan, that goes and he sees this guy lying on the road, broken and bleeding. And he stops and he grabs him. A man who was part Jew, yet despised by the Jews, offering aid to a Jew, cleaning his wounds, putting him on his own donkey, carries him to the end and cares for him. And then takes him and, and then pays for him and said, if there's anything else, put it on my tab. I will be back. And I'll bring up the count. What's the, what was the importance? Every Everyone is our neighbor. It is the hinge pin of our relationship with God. If we're not willing, let's, let's put it this way. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 that if we have anything against our brother were to do what? Actually, I think that was Matthew 5. Um, if we have anything against our brother, we're supposed to first lay, leave our offering at the altar, go take care of that, reconcile with our brother, then come and offer to God. He said in Matthew chapter 6, there at the end of the, uh, uh, Lord, the model prayer, prayer, that if we refuse to forgive our brother, if we refuse to forgive the trespasses done against us, God will not forgive us. In Matthew, I want to say 18. I'm not certain on this. What is Sam's quoting this? What you've done to the least to them, you've done to me. Um, that might be Matthew 20. Jesus said this. He said all of this. Okay, so if we do not love our neighbor, how then, and, and our neighbor whom we see, how then can we say that we love God? And I believe that's the point that you read in First John chapters 1 through 5. If we don't love our brother whom we see, how can we say we love God whom we can't see? That's the argument John himself makes in 1 John chapter 2, I think. Who then is our brother? All of mankind is our neighbor. All of mankind is in one fashion a brother to us. 
understand that every single one of us owes our existence to God, the creator. And yet every single one of us share one common ancestor. That being Noah and his wife. That being Adam and Eve. And it has been biologically proven, scientifically biologically proven, because biology is a science, that every single person on this planet has descended from one female. And if we've descended from one female, you know that we have descended from one male. So that means that every single one, a person on this earth is our brother. What is the importance of love in our relationship with God and our neighbors? If we cannot or do not love our neighbor, how can we say we love God? Question number three, how do we learn to love someone? Let's just still looking for that book for me. How did we learn to love someone? Heather says through our actions with intentionality. Sue says, we learn to love them by seeing them as God sees them. Sam says, from Christ, he loved God with his whole heart, and we are to use that as our example. Sister T said what Sue said, which is to say... We learn to love them by seeing them as God sees them. Mom and dad, when I was growing up, had a book written by Dr. James Dobson. You might recall Dr. James Dobson had a program called Focus on the Family. Um... It was a marriage seminar, I believe. And he was not of the church. However, he added some very good points. And I think dad went through the seminar in order to learn ways to be, you know, to help him in, in his counseling of uh, married individuals. And what the book's title was drew me to it. And so I read it, as you can imagine, because, well, that was just me. I've always wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps. Um, I wanted to be one of three things growing up. I either wanted to be a pilot, still do. I wanted to be a policeman, impossible for me anymore because of all my aches and pains. Or I wanted to be a preacher. I've accomplished that. And so dad had these books. Me being an avid reader, I read this one. And what impressed me was the logic behind this statement on the title. Love is a decision. And the reason, the reasoning behind it is love is not an emotion. I want you to stop and to think about this. The definition in the Greek of agape love, which we define as love, is the caring concern for the well-being of another. Now, 
Jesus said in the, the 21st chapter of John unto Peter, as they are uh, sitting around the fire on the shore of Lake Galilee, he says, Peter, son of Jonah, Actually, it's a Simon, son of Jonah. Lovest thou me, agape thou me, more than these? Simon says unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I phileo thee. Now, Lord is asking Peter, Do you love me? Do you care for my well-being enough the caring concern for the well-being of another do you do you concern yourself with my well-being peter says yeah lord i love you like a brother Jesus said, feed my sheep. Drawing your attention back a few chapters to John chapter 15, um, not 15. Let's see, bring me my Bible. Since O'Shea has the, the other phone that I normally use, I want my Bible. Um, he says... In there, I am the good shepherd. He doesn't, the shepherd, you know, the hireling is not going to care for my sheep, for the sheep, like the shepherd does. I'm getting that, uh, Teresa. So Jesus said, do you love me? Do you care for my well-being? And he says, yeah, Lord, you know I do. John chapter 10, Sister T. I love you like, a, I love you like my own brother. He says, Jesus says, feed my sheep. If you care for my well-being, if you are concerned for my well-being, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Think about that. Verse 11 of John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own, whose own the sheep are or not, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and runs. The wolf catches them, scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Now, I want you to jump down to verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it up and take it again. That word there, agape. God cares for my well-being because I lay down my life and take it up again. Back in John chapter 21, Beginning in, ver we're in 15 and following, Sister T, for our basis here. He comes to Simon again the second time, verse 16. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? That's agape. Agape thou me. Do you look care? Uh, do you have the caring concern for my well-being? And Peter says, yeah, Lord. I, you know, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. 
Jesus says, then feed my sheep. If you really truly care for me and for my well-being, you are going to care for my sheep. Take care of them. And he comes and he says it to him a third time. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me like a brother? And Peter, being grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? He says unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I agape you. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And I'm not 100% certain. Uh, Alicia, would you go and bring me up John 21, please? I want to double check that last uh, in verse 17. I believe he said phileo in, in that, but he might have actually said agape and agape. John chapter 21, sweetie. And go to the KJV Plus. And all the way down to verse 17. Now, you see where it says, lovest thou? Yeah, click on the, the, the number right there for me. Click on that. Okay. Click on it there. And then go over to the dictionary on the far left, bottom. No, no, far left, far left. Right next to the Bible list, not right next to the book list, the bottom. It's one of those that's going to pop out for me. There you go. No, yeah, that's phileo. That's what I thought. Now, look, let me see what Peter says. Go back to the other one. Uh, 5368. Scroll down just a hair. Scroll down, scroll down. Uh, yes, okay, I was right. So Jesus says, do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, yeah, yeah, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. The first two times in this path in this section of passage, Sister, Sister T, Jesus is asking if uh, scroll up. Let's see. Go to go to verse fifteen. I want you to notice. First off, we were looking at G five three six eight in verse seventeen. So in verse fifteen, when Jesus asked Peter, "Look at this. It's G twenty five." So look right there at Lovest, uh, right underneath Simon, Alicia. Uh, G25, yep, right there. Click on that and go over to the, the same dictionary again. Pop it out. Now look, it says agapeo, which means to welcome, to entertain, to be fond of, to love dearly. Um, Thayer doesn't define it the exact way that Dad does. But the idea... to um, you let's here. Let's hide that comment. No. Uh, switch over to go over three tabs on that one to mounts. Alicia. No, no, no. Go back to that dictionary. Up, 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 up. There's the tabs. Okay, now over, over. Over, over, down, down. Over one, to the right. The other side, there, other, there you go, right there. To value, esteem, to feel or manifest generous concern for. To be faithful for, towards, to delight in, to set store upon. And Dad has always described it as, if you go one more over to uh, Strong's there, let's get to the next one right, right between the two that you've, have had highlighted 
up right there. Uh, that's not going to help. There you go. Um, yeah, see, agape. Agape. So the idea then is Jesus is saying, Do you, are you concerned for my well-being so much that you... I mean, are are you do you really care for my well being? Agape means the caring concern for the well being of another, and this word is agapeo, which means to love, to be. Go back over to Mounts. I like Mounts's. Uh, the one right to the left of Strong's. Ah, there you go. Back over. Right there. Uh, to manifest, to feel or manifest generous concern for. Okay. So write that one down, Sister T. Agape. The caring concern for the well-being of another. Oh, a walking stick. Or a praying mantis. Praying rather. mantis. I think it's a male one. The males are smaller than yeah. the females. Are you going to be able to get it over here on... I don't know whether you might jump on here or not. Alicia, big screen us. Big screen us, Alicia. How about a praying mantis, guys? I don't want him to attack me. Mm, he's in your lap now. Yep. I am not going to be like Benjamin and have him uh, jump on me or bite me, so... Pretty sure that one's a male, which are smaller than the paper. Uh, I mean the the KJV actually, just leave him alone. I know I'm gonna get him off your stoop, so it doesn't come back into. There you go, buddy. Uh, that's a small one, Sister T. So that's probably a male, like O'Shea said. It was brown too, mm -hmm. rather than the greener ones of the of the. Red, brown, and. Green. Green. Each had their males and females. Ah. Um, I think the male ones are generally brown. And they're generally smaller. And they're always smaller. The females and the beating the males. Right. They decapitate them. Anyway. Um, I don't know why that is. God made them that way. I know. <laughs> so, the caring concern for the well-being of another. Jesus says, do you care? Do you have you... Do you care about my well-being? And Peter says, well, yeah, I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, if you care about my well-being, feed my sheep. I want to bring your attention also to the fact that Jesus, while on the cross, says to John, he says, behold your, mo your mother. And he says to his mother, behold your son. In other words, he's transferring to John that road, that that um, responsibility of caring for his mother. Now he's transferring to Peter the responsibility of caring for his sheep. He's leaving the responsibility in the hands of his apostles, of his disciples. He says, if you really care for me. If you care for my well-being, you feed my sheep. And finally, because Peter hasn't been getting the point, he says, if you love me like a brother, then feed my sheep. Love is a conscious decision to feel a certain way towards someone. When we love someone and decide to marry them, that means we're making a commitment to invest all of our time, our emotion, and our energy into that one person. When I, when I decided that Amy 
was the one, and I've made the the I've told people how. I'm not going to go into that story because we're running out of time. But I made that conscious decision. God blessed me with Amos. Here's the or Amy. Here's the signs. Here are the signs. And I said, "This is he found. He found the female." Yeah. Oh. Just because I was working next to it, and it's so cute. You know what it is. <laughs> this is a monarch caterpillar. Oh, yeah, a caterpillar. What do you get back on your leaf? We have a uh, we we actively have planted milkweed up here um, because I want the monarchs. I want to try to save monarchs, and they are not very prolific anymore. And I also want the uh, um, pollinators. Monarchs help pollinate my flowers in my garden. The butterflies do. So we actively plant my milkweed. You think it'd clear up just a little bit? No, it's too small. It's, it's too small. And so uh, here we have a monarch caterpillar on one of our milkweeds. We got some eggs there too. Yeah, I wasn't sure if those were the eggs of the... Yep. Anyway, so love is a conscious decision that I would, from that point, until I die, I was going to see after her well-being. I was going to take care of her. I was going to provide for her. I was going to shelter her. And I was going to do everything in my power to make sure that she was well. To, to provide for her happiness. See to, the, to it that she was happy and content. It's a conscious decision. And as I've noticed, folks, we don't fall in love. As I look around the world and, and, and at, at all these people and they say, oh, we fell in love. No, no. What you guys are describing is you've fallen in lust. You've fallen in lust and you've decided then that at least for temporarily, you're going to love that person. You're going to invest your emotion and your time. Unfortunately, everybody, you know, people are going at it with the idea that they can, they'll, they'll try it for a while and see if they like it. If they like it, they'll buy it. But you know when we when we make that conscious effort, when we make that conscious decision to invest our time, our energy, our effort, our money, our resources, everything into that one person, that's when we that's when we love a person. When we look out for their well-being rather than ours. And look what Jesus said in Ephesians chapter 5. This is, that is agape love. That is agape love. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself for it. That's agape love. Yes, I saw your comment. I was going to make a comment on it, Sam. Because that's exactly what happened with me. 
I never, I, I made the, I made the conscious decision back when I was 16 that I would not go looking for a mate. I said, God, when you decide I'm ready, you send me the woman you want me to be with. And as such, I'm not going to look. And I didn't. That the name he fell right in my lap, as it were. And Sam said, when he uh, stopped looking is when his wife, when, his, when Helen started chasing him. And Teresa said, I, she's the one that chased uh, her husband. So how do we learn to love someone? We have to make a conscious effort. We have to make a conscious decision to love someone. And that means that we have to make the conscious decision, like Sue said, to love or to see them as God sees them. Guys, God says that we were worth his son. God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was so concerned for our well-being that he sent his son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said. He said. That the cost, even though it was steep, our value was worth the life of his son. Think about it this way. One man's blood bought an entire world was enough to pay for the entire world that's quite possible sister t okay question number four how strong is your love for god and sam says strong and still growing amen Diana says, or Heather says, sometimes not as strong as it should be, but probably not as weak as it could be, right? Sue says, my love for God grows daily by daily reading and studying, so I guess each day it's not as strong as it should be, and it's getting stronger. Sister T says, my love for God should be stronger, and I believe it is getting there. All right. Let's get moving on to the next four questions because mine was also it's great at getting some growing stronger daily, and that's the way it should be. Let's put four minutes on the clock as we record our answers to these four questions. Question number one, write down one question or observation you have over Romans 13. <laughs> That's right, sister. Unity. Write down one question or observation you have over Romans 13. O'Shea, could you come here a minute? Question number two. Alicia, wake up. Question number two. List two things that motivate you to stay away from sin. <laughs> Come over here, Amos. <laughs> Long question, too. Need me to be a time runner? Questionnaire? Yep. 
coffee, you know. Coffee. Question number two. Hi, y'all. Question number three. How will this chapter help you in your daily walk with God? And finally, question number four. List one action step you would take in your life based on today's reading. Beginning with, I will. Or as we sometimes call it, the I will question. Time is up. Bet your dad stepped in there and started looking for the ethics book right real quick. No. Oh, and Teresa, you can tell it's on. I have my hindi hat. <laughs> Mom's home. All righty. Question number one. Write down one question or observation you have over Romans 13. Let's see. Can you give me the first answer? Teresa says, verse one. Let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God and the powers that are or that be ordained of God. <laughs> Teresa says I will. <laughs> Sam says to obey God, respect the law, and love God, and everyone with whole heart serve God. Amen. We need to respect the law, love God, and love everyone. As, of course, Dad's been going through describing. And with our whole heart serve God. Those are all very good observations. Next. Do we have another one? Or do we move on to question number two? Yep, we move on to question two. Okay. Question number two then, I guess. What's two things that motivate you to stay away from sin? Who has our first answer, let's see.
Bed's back. A little warm out there. It is getting a little warm, especially when you're in the sun. I know. Bye bye. Thank you. Go to race and tell Sean I had my indie hat on. (laughs) Okay. Thank you, Osha. We're on question two. two. Let's do things that motivate you to stay away from sin. Sam says. Christ taking the nail for me and wanting me to be close to the Father, to be with him for all eternity. All right. What else we got, Alicia? Sister T's. Praying and knowing God sees all. Did Heather have any? She's probably busy washing a poodle. Uh, that's all the no, that's it. Okay, I don't know if O'Shea told you what my answer did. O'Shea say anything about my answer to uh, number one? Mm, I don't think no. Okay, uh, number one, I had disobedience to government, by the way, is. Of the works of darkness. Did anybody catch that? In the lesson? Bring up the Bible again for us real quick. Romans 13. Let me get you an exact verse. I know. Ten minutes. Or fifteen minutes, actually. As we read through through chapters, uh, chapter 13, um, verse 12 says, The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. So in this chapter, as we begin verse chapter 13, it's talking about being subject unto the higher powers. And we are to render to all, therefore, their dues, verse 7. And we're to give love to each other we're not to owe any man anything but to love one another verse eight so being subject to higher powers rendering to them their due and owing her and and loving all men is our is is or our works of the day therefore being not being subject not rendering and not loving our works of darkness. So disobedience to the governments, this will be, you know, un, and being unloving toward our neighbors and being rebellious and not rendering to the people, to, you know, rendering to people respect or taxes or whatever is a work of, a, of darkness. And we're supposed to cast those off. This is why you see uh, the Christians not fighting against governments in the new, uh, you know, it, in, in the first century, in the second century, in the third century. Jesus said th- that that was why his servants didn't fight because to to re- to uh, re- um, save him, rescue him from uh, Pilate is because his kingdom wasn't of this world. 
what he taught Peter was the taxes, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, unto God that which is God's. List two things that motivate you to stay away from sin. One is the love of God. And two is a desire to please God. As you guys have said, praying to God, Sister T says, knowing God sees all, these are motivations. As Sam said, um, Christ taking the nail was a motivation wanting to be close to the father and be with him for eternity is a motivation to stay away from sin and all those are wrapped up in a desire to please God in a desire to uh, in a love of God 1 John 5 3 1 John 1 7 Question number three was, how will this chapter help you in your daily walk with God? And Sam says, giving proper. Uh, let's see, why don't we start with number three? With Teresa, because she was first. To stay focused on God. This chapter teaches her to stay focused on God and his word. How, let me ask you, Sister T, as you ponder this question, then, how does this chapter uh, teach you to stay focused on God's word. Something to ponder about. <laughs> um, Sam says, giving proper respect and thought. Uh, the word helps in what I need to do. This chapter encourages the proper attitude toward God's earthly ministers. You know, whether we're dealing with uh, governments, as in earthly governments, or we're dealing with the way that God has set up the congregation, it gives us the proper attitude. What are elders? They are the way that God has set up to oversee our souls. So we need to have the proper respect for them. Does that mean that elders will now fail? That elders won't fall? Of course it doesn't. Elders are human. Does that mean that governments aren't evil? No. But it means that, again, they're in so long as the government does not contradict God's law, we are to be in obedience. For 40-some, 50-some years, this land was held in bondage unto a uh, ruling by the Supreme Court, an evil ruling that people interpreted as a law, which it wasn't a law. But thanks be to God that we actually had... What are these? But thanks be to God that we actually had um, some judges that were willing to correct that. To change it for the better. No, Amos should have had this phone. But did we still live in respect, out of respect to the, the other laws? Of course we did. How will this chapter help encourage and help us in our daily walk with God? Now, let's, now question number four. Oh, and O'Shea gets to do noontime today because he's home. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Question number four, Alicia. Question number four. Hello, hello. Question number four, write down one action step you will take in your life based on today's reading. Teresa says, I will stay positive. 
Sam says, I will obey Christ. Like we were talking about earlier, the Bible doesn't say try. It actually doesn't say do your best. It says do. Knowing that we will do our best for him because we love him. And our best is going to be not good enough at times, but it is our best. And it will be acceptable because if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I just mangled that. Jesus has given us an avenue of um, I don't want to put it. All sin. Okay, let me let me put it this way. Jesus has understood and, and understands that at times we're going to fall. That's not the point. The point is the, the, the point is not that we're going to fall, but that Jesus has made uh, I'll think of the word yet. There, there's a word I'm looking for. The point is not that we're going to fall, but Jesus has made um, provision for when we do. That's the word I was looking for, provision. The point is, though, Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't try. There's just do or do not. You will either do or you won't. I will obey God and his ministers here on earth so long as they do not conflict with God and his laws. Jesus has made provision for the times when we will fall, whether we know that we have fallen or not, because there are times when we do um, fall, not intentionally and not knowingly. We can be going down the road, dri you know, driving down the road at 55 mile an hour and we'll be in talking to the person next to us and not realize that our speed has crept up to 57, 58, 60. As soon as we notice it, we, may, we make the cor proper correction. But Jesus has made provision for that time through his blood. If we drive in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Don't go through life looking there, there are two principles here. One, do not go through life looking at, at life through rose-tinted glasses. Life is not fair. Life is not rosy. Be real. 
on the same token, do not go through life looking and nitpicking every sin, every action, every deed. God has called us to a life of service, a life of work, a life of carrying the gospel wherever we go. And we should be living a life of repentance, but a life of praise, a life of love, and a life of peace. If we are so scared that we're going to, to, to fall, if we go through life with an attitude of, um, being, uh, of, of being so scared that we're going to fall, where's the peace? Where's the joy? It's not there. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we come before your throne thanking you for another day of life and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for the study of Romans 13, showing us how we are to live in relation to, to your powers here on this earth. We thank you for explaining that the governments are your ministers and that we are to be in obedience to them. We thank you also, Father, for clarifying that it is your principle that we are to obey them so long as they do not contradict your law. And Father, we thank you for providing the propitiation for our sin, the mercy seat of your son. We thank you for providing that blood wherein we can call you Father. We can appeal to your mercy and your forgiveness even when we don't realize that we have sinned. We pray now that you would forgive us of all the sins that we have done knowingly. We come to you in repentance. And for all the sins that we may have unintentionally done, Father, or sins that now come to mind as we have gained new knowledge, we come begging your forgiveness we wish to live a life that is pleasing to you in service of you for we love you father for sending your son and for loving us we thank you for teaching us that love is a decision not just an emotion and we love you with our whole heart our whole mind our whole soul and, and strength Help us to develop the love for our neighbor that we need to have, that we are concerned for their entire well-being. Help us to put our action steps into practice, that we may love you and obey you, that we may obey those who have the rule over us, whether earthly governments or spiritual that you have put in place to watch out for our souls. We pray for our ministers, whether they be the governments and earthly governments, we ask your, your guidance on their hands, that they may rule wisely and in accordance with your will. Father, we pray that you would cast down any wicked rulers. We pray that you would cast down any evil laws that are in opposition to your, your law, your divine will. And Father, we pray that you would defeat any wickedness on the part of Satan that would try to hamper us from serving and worshiping you. We come to you also praying on behalf of our elders, on behalf of the men that oversee the congregations around the world, as they have been put in those positions by you, we pray that they may live godly lives, that they may rule wisely and watch out for the souls of their congregations. Father, that they may be just and merciful, loving and kind. We pray that you would guard their steps 
that they may walk right without stumbling. And Father, we pray that you would help them in their service, that they may have wisdom to discern good from evil, wisdom to apply your standard, your rule, as they watch over and care for our souls. Help us to live in subjection to them with the proper attitude of respect and the proper attitude that you want us to live under. Watch, guard, and keep them. May they grow. May we grow. It is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. As you walk this day with the King, it is our prayer that you will add to your faith devotion. Noontime Nuggets is now four minutes late. And again, hope to see you there, guys. Thank you for being with us. God bless.